Okay, the question is uh, how tightly do you have to control CA50? If you go back to the first day's lectures, remember I discussed using GT power and these codes, you can specify a combustion timing, a CA50, and a combustion duration. Uh, you're not modeling it, you just specify those numbers. And you can look at what the effect is on grossly indicated efficiency or even NOx um, and get an idea, all right? Uh, it's not a huge function of that, but in reality what happens is if you go too late in combustion phasing, you start to see cycle-to-cycle uh, -cycle variability becoming very important because the combustion uh, process becomes very, very sensitive to operating parameters like intake temperature. And so if you have a cycle where, for instance, the combustion is sluggish, uh, you might find that the uh, gases that are left in the combustion chamber for the next cycle are more rich in fuel. And so that now in that next cycle, you're going to have combustion that's too fast, you know, because you have a higher fuel air ratio. And so you get into this problem of large cyclic variability. So basically, what the rule of thumb is anything after about 15 degrees after top dead center, you want to avoid that because that's where you'll start to see a lot of cyclic variability. And anything way before top dead center is going to give you high NOx because you have a lot of time at high temperatures uh, which creates nitric oxide. So there's a span there of 10, 15 degrees of crank angle that are kind of acceptable. Uh, and so within that range, you know, plus minus two degrees is probably okay. So that's just a feel, yeah, right? Any other questions? Yeah. So that's, that's one of the issues, and I, for the reasons I just mentioned, if you have high hydrocarbons, uh, that's kind of a dead giveaway that you can expect high cyclic variability. Um, and again, it depends on the load. So at high load, it's not a problem. You don't see uh, much cyclic variability. But at light load, uh, you do see an issue. And then, I, I should have said intermediate load is not a problem. But if you go to really high load, then you start to see a problem again because it's a kinetically controlled combustion process. Small changes in intake temperature, whether they be through you know, the EGR system, or you can have maldistribution of EGR in a multi-cylinder engine where some cylinders are getting more EGR than others, uh, and that this is, uh, you know, it's, an, uh, it's impacted by uh, the combustion efficiency in each uh, combustion <coughs> chamber. So it becomes very complicated and you start to see a larger CRV. Uh, but in the in the range that you know around mid load, it's not a big problem. Uh, the other thing I should mention that cyclic variability is a major problem in your car engine, your spark ignition engine, and you know there's the reason why there's two, three, four hundred engineers working on those engines is to deal with these problems. I mean, they are those those engine calibration engineers. That's their job. Uh, so there are ways. Uh, to work on this, and they're quite elaborate. Yeah. Do you know, so you did a nice sensitivity study for the different advanced combustion methods. Are there reported data or acceptable data for the similar sensitivity analysis for traditional spark or spark? Yeah, uh, if you look in, you know, even in Hayward's book, he would have some discussion of that. Um, but in SAE papers, I'm sure you'd find that. Right, so the question is the sensitivity to the fuels. Um, yeah, that is an issue, uh, and you need to have a very precise fuel injection capability. But, you know, again, if you look at a diesel engine, a commercial diesel engine, they can specify the amount of fuel delivered down into the, the percents or less, you know. So uh, this, is, this is why engines are so much cleaner today than they were 20 years ago, is this precise control over the combustion event. So yeah, it requires control. Any more? Yeah. Right. I'm going to talk a little more about that in a minute, but let me just uh, preface it by saying that I think the biggest problem 
uh, is with natural gas and low load operation. Because if you have CH4 in your exhaust, you need very high temperatures in order to effectively oxidize that in a catalyst, 600 C or something. Uh, and you just don't get that out of the engine. So I think that's the biggest problem. And that's where RCCI has a huge advantage because if you can blend, and I, actually the next slide is gonna show this, if you can blend the, uh, the methane with the diesel fuel optimally in the combustion chamber, you can change its octane number from being a fuel that's really hard to burn to a fuel that uh, is easier to burn and therefore you would have lower unburned methane. But that's a big problem with that fuel. Yeah? So for any RCCI compound, do you have to have some kind of active reaction to be able to optimize? Well, I showed you open loop and closed loop control, but obviously the, the uh, closed loop would be effective, more effective uh, at controlling uh, the engine. Uh, because, you know, as I go to Colorado and, and I I'm essentially need a different effective octane number in my fuel, here, all you do is just change the amounts that you're going to be uh, injecting or port fuel injecting in response to trying to keep the CA50 uh, where you would like it. Uh, and it's hard to put that into tables, you know. So I think the, the closed loop control is the way to go. Okay, uh, so we were talking about uh, natural gas. I just wanted to finish that up by looking at natural gas composition effects. In the simulations I showed you, here we just assumed that we had methane as natural gas, but real natural gas consists of you know, many different uh, components, some of them listed here. And the amounts of each of these are completely variable depending on the source of the natural gas. So it was of interest to see what happens to these results if you uh, were to have some longer chain alkanes mixed in with your methane. So we looked at the case where we just added ethane uh, and <clears throat> as you can see here, um, this is, I think, the high load operating point. Let me just check that. Yeah, this is the 23 bar operating point with the triple injection that I just discussed. <laughs> and <clears throat> for 100% methane, this is what the pressure trace looked like. In other words, it was a, a kind of a drawn out combustion event, as you can see in the heat release curve. As I start adding ethane to the uh, the blend uh, going from uh, zero to 10% ethane, you see significant effect on the combustion pressure trace and also on the heat release. That means that you would need different optimization strategies because some of these rates here are, the uh, pressurized rates are unacceptable. Um, and you can see that from this plot here. Here's uh, the zero ethane going to 10% ethane. Um, and if you look at the pressure rise rate, the green curve here, you see it starts out around five bar per degree and goes all the way up to 20 as I go from here to here. And that would be uh, un you know, unacceptably high pressure rise rates, especially at this high load operating point. Um, so what one would have to do is go back and recalibrate your injection strategy depending on what the fuel composition was and since you, that might be changing in the field or whatever, you would really want to have active pressure feedback control so that you can monitor where CA50 is and make the appropriate changes um, with a, an, an ECU-based uh, engine calibration. So yeah, I think that's crucial. You know, if you're going to be, if you're presenting a, a technology that's fuel flexible, uh, obviously you need to know what that fuel is and and how you can compensate for changes in the fueling. Interesting though, if you look at this red data here, which is the CA10, the 10% burn point, it doesn't care how much ethane there is. Why? The diesel is doing the ignition, right? So it doesn't care what the composition of the fluid is. You can at least control the combustion phasing that way. The details of the pressure rise rate, though, the burning of the mixture of the two fuels is what's uh, the thing that needs to be controlled. Um, okay, so this is just a quick summary of the natural gas uh, uh, characteristics I just discussed. Um, so we can run with natural gas and diesel. Um, 
we've shown that you can get good combustion phasing over a wide range of intake temperatures. Uh, basically, you can account for that by changing the natural gas diesel ratio. Our multi-objective genetic algorithm uh, was used to basically find calibrations or demonstrate it could be done over a wide range from 4 bar to 20 bar. Uh, and we were able to meet 2010 heavy duty engine emissions regulations in cylinder. Uh, as I showed you, uh, it was helpful to have more than two injections, especially at high load. Um, what else here? Uh, the study showed, as I said, that the triple injections were also beneficial at light load. They reduced the NOx there and also allowed you to increase combustion efficiency. Remember, uh, I showed you that the increase in, in combustion efficiency is what gave you the improvements in gross efficiency. But this is because you, you're using up more of the methane, and that would have been the problem in the uh, exhaust after treatment, as we were just discussing. Um, so uh, I'm kind of excited about um, the use of RCCI in uh, natural gas dual fuel engines because it offers um, a, a kind of a, a pass to the implementation of this technology in engines that already have port injection of natural gas and direct injection of diesel. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears now. Any questions there before I continue? All right, so let's look at after treatment. I mentioned to you that hydrocarbons and CO are an issue with low temperature combustion strategies, whether they be HCCI, PCCI, or RCCI. And uh, we've been working with the group at Oak Ridge National Lab who have uh, very uh, good instrumentation capabilities uh, looking at uh, after treatment and exhaust emissions. Um, so they were interested in looking at the performance of the engine over the entire EPA federal test procedure operating cycle. The dots that you see here represent uh, points that are taken from the EPA FTP cycle. Um, and you can see here that basically most of the time where there's a big cluster of points here, you're operating at relatively light loads. Uh, it's only occasionally that you venture out into the high speed, high load operating points. Uh, for conventional diesel combustion, it turns out that the highest efficiency points, this is brake thermal efficiency, are way out in the region where you never operate. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. With RCCI, the peak efficiency points are actually higher than they are with conventional diesel, but they are at much lower uh, brake mean effective pressures. And so you would actually use them more. Uh, what the results that I just show here were for an RCCI automotive diesel engine operating without EGR. If you add EGR capability, you can extend the uh, operating regime as shown here. So you can cover more of the range uh, that might be of uh, interest in the FTP. Of course, I should just mention, you have the other option, which we've also explored, which is to use RCCI while you're inside this uh, range, and then switch to a regular diesel combustion when you're outside the range, and then you benefit from all of this, right? Because you still have the diesel fuel injector, and you can just turn off the gasoline. So it's quite versatile. Um, the issue, though, is exhaust temperatures, right? This is where your catalyst, uh, the considerations for your catalyst become important. For conventional diesel combustion going all the way up to 18 bar here, high load points, and you can see that your exhaust temperatures can reach 700, uh, this is C here, exhaust gas temperatures. Um, here's that uh, RCCI range, and shown blown up over here. You see that your peak temperatures are basically uh, about 100 degrees lower in RCCI than they are in conventional diesel. So part of the reason for that is you got more energy out of the insulin, the gases that was converted to work. Well, that's great, but your uh, exhaust en energy is lower, which means you have less energy available to drive your turbocharger, plus less energy available to help in the catalysis in your exhaust system. 
Uh, so the engine that we were running, we concluded finally that basically uh, the OEM turbocharger system on that engine was not optimal for RCCI operation, uh, and that a two-stage turbocharger, which is actually currently available for that same engine in Europe, would probably be a better uh, design. But nevertheless, we tested the engine with its stock configuration to try to understand some of the requirements for uh, after treatment. Uh, bottom line, though, is the low exhaust gas temperatures in this uh, FTP driving area are a challenge for oxidation catalysts. Catalyst efficiencies need to be uh, over 90%. In fact, we have just recently conducted some tests at Oak Ridge which show that we can get um, uh, conversion with efficiencies in the 98%, even with relatively low exhaust temperatures. And I'll show you that result in a minute as well. So the Oak Ridge lab uh, arrangement is basically similar to what we had at Wisconsin. Uh, we uh, provided them with uh, some guidance on how to run the engine. It basically fueled with port fuel injection of gasoline and direct injection of diesel. Uh, and it's set up with uh, after treatment uh, uh, DOC and a DPF uh, for soot um, uh, filtration and so on. And they did some uh, testing, this is uh, relatively old here, at 4 bar, uh, 2300 RPM, and showed that RCCI running with 77% gasoline uh, offered a, an improvement over conventional diesel operating efficiency, brake, brake thermal efficiency, while an order of magnitude lower NOx, engine out NOx, huge two orders of magnitude lower soot, but higher unburned hydrocarbons and CO, and much lower exhaust temperatures. 412 here at this operating point for conventional diesel, 260 for RCCI. So <clears throat> uh, just to say that again, the NOx results were compared for conventional diesel at this operating point for PCCI with diesel fuel, and then RCCI over here. Uh, and as you see, there's a big advantage in NOx, meaning you don't need an SCR system, at least at this operating point, uh, to reduce NOx. Uh, also, they were interested in the hydrocarbons. So here's the RCCI configuration at DOC, uh, which is basically like a three-way catalyst, except you're only using two of the ways in a three-way catalyst, because you don't need the NOx. For conventional diesel, low output high, uh, engine out hydrocarbons, uh, they are also dealt with with the DOC. Same with PCCI. And here with RCCI, you see a significant amount of engine out hydrocarbon, uh, but a lot of that is dealt with uh, even at these low temperatures uh, with the DOC. So their conclusion was that RCCI was a fuel efficient uh, engine process with emissions that could be controlled with the DOC. And so that led them to further work, uh, which continues to this day, on looking at RCCI. Um, the other thing was the particulates. <clears throat> so RCCI particulate matter was found to be very, very different than conventional diesel particulate matter. Uh, so in particular, here they show these pictures of what you capture on a filter. You see, uh, I showed you this uh, earlier this week, for conventional diesel, very black smoke uh, collected on the filter. Um, and some of that is dealt with also in the DOC, is slightly reduced. Uh, so that indicates to me, I guess, that there are both elemental and organic constituents in the particulates. The DOC is able to oxidize some of the organic components. Same thing here with the engine out uh, suit for RCCI the DOC does, uh, is able to reduce uh, the emissions of particulate matter somewhat, even with the much lower uh, exhaust temperatures. The other interesting thing that they showed was particle size distribution. So this is the number density of particles as a function of their size uh, coming out of the engine. Uh, so if we focus on the black and the red data here, which is the conventional diesel uh, engine out number density and the conventional diesel after the DOC, you see they're pretty similar 
and very high number densities in this range of particle size above 50 nanometers. The PCCI also has high particle <coughs> number densities, uh, but lower in some parts of the range than conventional diesel. And down here is the RCCI. You see, even though the masses were on the same scale, here the particle number density is way lower, uh, two orders of magnitude lower. And so if you just blow up this region here and show it on a linear scale, you see that the DOC is effective at reducing those small particles in the exhaust, the, the, nucleus, the nucleation mode particles, uh, which again, uh, we believe are largely organic fraction components. In other words, condensed fuel. Uh, but it's not that effective once you reach the 20, micro, 20 nanometer limit uh, that is the sort of legislated uh, uh, size for particle number density legislation. So this is kind of interesting that you see much lower numbers of particles. So uh, one of my students just recently has been looking at trying to model, uh, improve our suit models by modeling some of these condensation processes. Um, and um, he'll be presenting these results at the um, ASME meeting in October. Uh, but basically he took our uh, single cylinder oil test engine operating at two operating points and uh, match the cylinder pressure and heat release curves like you've seen uh, here before. And then what he did was to replace the, uh, the equations of state in our code with more realistic equations of state that allow you to track both the liquid phase and the gas phase of the fuel components. So this is a phase diagram showing pressure temperature here for uh, isooctane and for n-hexadecane. So those would be the, the sample fuels, if you like, for the low reactivity fuel and the high reactivity fuel. Um, so if you have just pure isooctane and you operate on this uh, orange line here, to the left of this line you would have liquid, to the right of the line you would have vapor. If you blend the two fuels, you now get a phase diagram where you can uh, identify the dotted line, let's say for this case here, that's blue 30, 70 mixture in hexadecane isooctane. The dotted line being the bubble point where the liquid would start to show evidence of bubbles. And on this side here would be the point where the condensed uh, gases start to produce um, droplets. So that's your typical uh, vapor dome, if you like. It's kind of interesting to see uh, that these higher order hydrocarbons have quite a different shaped vapor dome than the one you see in the textbook for water. All right? uh, so there's some very interesting things that happen when you have phase boundaries where you can have a constant temperature by increasing the pressure, you can cause condensation. Uh, you wouldn't see that with, uh, with water, for instance. So it's pretty interesting uh, to try to extend the work. So what he's done is uh, replace the equations of state, and he's gone through quite a lot of effort in the code to make sure that we can track phase transitions like this. And I'll just show you some simulations. This is just for the, the injection of the diesel fuel or the N-hexadecane in this uh, example. Here's the spray being injected. Uh, he's showing the results uh, at uh, 50 degrees before top dead center, that's just after the first injection. Uh, and what you're seeing here in the color scheme is condensed fuel. So even within the spray, you have regions where the equivalence ratios are high, temperatures are low, uh, and um, the, there is a tendency for those large molecular weight components to condense. Uh, here's the temperature field. Uh, and here's for the second injection, you, you even see some condensed fuel uh, coming from the second injection. So, even within the spray, you see some condensation. But uh, by the end of the spray process, and when combustion occurs, most of this uh, condensed phase re-evaporates. And so this is showing you the amount of condensate as a function of crank angle. Uh, here you started the injections. Uh, you see, if you look at the gasoline and the diesel, most of the condensate is the diesel. And now we're at uh, close to top dead center. We undergo combustion. And then later in the cycle, during the expansion stroke, you start to see the appearance of condensate once again, uh, the red being the gasoline. It's a log plot here, right? And the black being the uh, diesel fuel. 
So mostly you can see it's from the gasoline. And it's basically the gasoline coming back out of the crevice regions that is condensing uh, as the pressure drops here. So what he did was to uh, track the condensate and look at what was in the combustion chamber at the time when the exhaust valves open. So this is predicted condensed fuel uh, and the amount of soot that would be the elemental carbon at exhaust valve opening for those two operating points. So what you can see from this is that uh, for the higher load point, we have more engine out soot, that's the black part, and this is actually the experimentally uh, determined soot. Uh, but you also see, at least in his prediction here, significant amount of condensed gasoline. And this is really consistent with what the people at Oak Ridge have been saying, is that they're seeing, in some cases, 98% of the particulate out of the engine is organic fraction. Only 2% is the, uh, is the uh, elemental carbon. And you see at light load, uh, actually more diesel. We were injecting more diesel at light load, so you see more diesel uh, in the prediction to be condensed. So we're just starting to scratch the surface here, but I think this is kind of interesting to be able to predict uh, the phase of the unburnt hydrocarbons uh, as well. So, questions? Yeah, so the question is how confident are we in the models when we have triple injections, for instance? Uh, we don't have a whole lot of experimental data. Uh, we are working with uh, the group at Sandia. Um, Mark Musculus, for instance, is looking at post injections. Uh, and actually, you have pilot injection, main injection, post injection. And we've been quite uh, happy with some of the simulation results uh, there. But there's still a need for a lot more validation work. Um, but you're right. I mean, this is, we, we're, we're using the model in the safe space, and we're extrapolating to a less safe space. Yeah. yeah. Yes, there's, thank you, the components of the, of the engine out hydrocarbons. The Oak Ridge guys have published a number of papers, I think I referred to some of them in the references here, uh, where they show a detailed breakdown. A lot of it is aldehydes, uh, as you might expect, today, right? You didn't complete the, the path from fuel to aldehyde to uh, CO, and it was interrupted at the aldehyde stage. stage. Um, but they have a very good analysis. Uh, they, they've also um, looked at some very interesting results very recently, uh, looking at the organic part of the soot. Uh, where is that coming from? Is that coming from the gasoline, from the diesel, or from the lube oil? Uh, and what they've concluded to date is that the lube oil is really not the thing that's providing the organic part of the particulate. Uh, that's coming from the fuels. Uh, they can do that by, tra by looking at metals in the particulates, uh, so they know what metals are in the lube oil, and then using uh, XF, what is it, X-ray fluorescence techniques, they can figure out uh, whether those metals are in the particulates or not. And they have a fantastic uh, set of equipment for analyzing uh, engine emissions. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> let me just then move on to talk a little bit more about after treatment. So we had this question earlier about the catalyst and its efficiency. Um, as I mentioned, at low loads, this is a problem because your exhaust temperatures are so low. So uh, while we were running those transient experiments where we were changing from one bar to four bar, uh, as I showed you a minute ago, we also ran some uh, intermediate cases and measured engine out uh, emissions and uh, DOC out emissions uh, and used those to calibrate the GT power 
uh, DOC model. So basically the combustion process in the engine is modeled using Kiva. We've already seen this many times, the pressure trace, the heat release, and so on. And then the, uh, the uh, DOC performance is modeled using the GT power models calibrated for our engines. Um, here are two cases I'm going to be discussing. Case one with one bar, case two with 2.5 bar. This case actually has a reasonably high exhaust temperature. Uh, this case had a relatively low engine out uh, temperature. So what we thought of was, well, <clears throat> we want to increase the exhaust temperature for that light load operating point. One way to do that is to open the exhaust valves earlier. In other words, to sacrifice some of the PDV work uh, with the potential advantage of then generating higher exhaust temperatures. So what we did, and this is all uh, in the GT Power code, is here's your standard exhaust valve lift diagram. We basically allowed the exhaust valve to open, assuming we had a variable valve uh, actuation system that would uh, uh, allow you to benefit from this concept. So here's the high, the high load or the two point, was it five bar case? And here's the, the one bar case. And you're looking at uh, the stock exhaust valve opening timing. And as you move in this direction, you're opening the exhaust valves earlier. The three curves correspond to the temperature that you see uh, pre-turbine, that's this red here. And then pre-catalyst is the purplish color. And then the green uh, would be on the other side of the DOC. So pre pre DOC, post DOC. And as you see, those are the temperatures that are of interest, especially the purple one here. You want that to be as high as possible in order to have the catalyst light off and uh, convert the uh, unburned hydrocarbons effectively. Uh, when you do that, you also see there's some implications of these changes in exhaust valve uh, timing on uh, the combustion process because basically the uh, the, the conditions in the combustion chamber that are left for the ne next cycle will be higher temperature uh, residual gases, which then tend to advance the combustion. So there's some changes in um, the combustion phasing. But the bottom line is this plot, which shows the brake mean effective pressure variation. Here's your stock exhaust valve timing. As you uh, open the exhaust valves earlier, you start to see eventually a decrease in engine out power. But you can go all the way to 80 or even 70 uh, degrees uh, of, uh, at the exhaust valve opening before you see a, a, a starting to see a fast drop off. So this was an interesting idea. <coughs> Using our calibrated, <coughs> excuse me, calibrated um, DOC models, what we found was <coughs> that uh, if we use the stuck timing for case one here, stock exhaust valve timing, the conversion, percent conversion of hydrocarbons uh, for, and CO was down in the 20%. But by opening the exhaust valves at 80 degrees, you know, roughly 15 degrees earlier, we could see conversions up in the 90 and close to 100% for the CO and hydrocarbon. So this is very exciting because it says if you had the capability to change the, the valve timing, especially during startup where you want these high temperatures, your catalyst is either cold or is cooled down, you want it to light off, um, you can do that by uh, dint of changing the, uh, the exhaust valve timing. So this can be done with a cam phaser, and it's already cam phasers are widely used in the industry. Um, so we think this might be one solution. The other solution is to make a better, better catalyst, right? A catalyst that's more effective um, at operating at low gas temperatures. So both of those are, are potential directions to work. For case two, these are big numbers here. The scale is, I'm just looking at the very top here, from 98 to 100. For case two, basically changing the exhaust valve opening time really has very little effect. Uh, because the temperatures are already high. Um, so, <clears throat> summary then. So, due to the high cost uh, and the complexity 
and also the increased fuel and fluid consumption associated with exhaust after treatment, there is a growing need for advanced combustion development. I mentioned to you last time that the SCR system on a heavy duty diesel costs the same as the engine, right? So we're looking for alternatives also for petroleum uh, that have the potential for large scale production. That's why we're interested in ethanol and uh, natural gas and so on. Uh, so uh, it would be desirable to modify the fuel's re reactivity to allow you to have sufficient pre-mixing of the fuel and air that it helps you avoid high equivalence ratios that give you soot. Uh, also, by having a dilution of the combustion process, you can lower NOx. High octane fuels like gasoline, natural gas, or alcohol is therefore of great interest. However, there are challenges with the stability and controllability of the combustion process when you start going to these less reactive fuels. For instance, I showed you with homogeneous charge compression ignition, you are seeing <clears throat> that um, uh, this is relatively simple because you basically can port inject the fuels, you get very good emissions characteristics, but you can have high pressure rise rates and lack of control, especially cycle to cycle control, uh, because of the very high sensitivity to uh, temperature. And especially with a, sim a single fuel, that becomes a big problem. Uh, for partially premixed combustion, the advantages are that you have some control over the combustion phasing due to the direct injection timing. Uh, also, um, you can uh, control how much fuel is direct injected which helps you to gain equivalence ratio control. And so that provides some degree of control, but I showed you the limitations to that. Some fuels, such as gasoline, are not that sensitive to equivalence ratio, especially at low pressures, and this causes a lack of control. Dual fuel approaches like reactivity compression ignition have advantages in the sense that the blending of the fuel reactivity allows you to control the start of combustion timing and the duration of the combustion process. Um, so that's uh, a big advantage. The challenge, of course, is that you require two fuels. And uh, that is uh, obviously something that uh, requires a change in uh, thinking. So any questions about this part? So you're talking about the CFD models? Yeah. Right, so the question is, are the models fast enough to be useful? Um, you know, what we've tried to do is to make CFD models that run in about a day, okay? Now, actually, every point is one day, yeah, one cycle. Uh, that's a long time. So we have uh, also integrated simpler models with GT power that are more like uh, zero-dimensional combustion models that can be run. And in fact, the, the student who's doing that after treatment modeling with GT power is using those models. They can kind of get you into the ballpark because we, we know that if we just look at the global fuel PRF number, in other words, for both fuels, what is the PRF number, the global PRF number? That gives you a very good indicator of when the combustion starts. So that's uh, something we've determined from lab experiments and also from the simulations. Knowing the start of combustion is one of the input parameters to GT Powers models. The duration of combustion, the results really don't depend too much on that, especially if you're just looking at global things like is the turbocharger providing appropriate boost pressures and so on. So essentially, you can use the multidimensional models to learn how to calibrate simpler models, which then can be used uh, you know, to make a quick exploratory analysis. So that's kind of our philosophy here. In the lab, you, know, uh, you develop a sense of what needs to be done, and uh, some of our students have developed tables that help them determine gas 
diesel fuel ratios and things of that nature. Uh, for example, in the four-cylinder engine, uh, it is found that you need to run with a different gas diesel ratio in each of the four cylinders. Uh, so that's horrible. But it has to do with the fact that each uh, cylinder has a slightly different volumetric efficiency because of the design of the intake manifolds. But once you've figured that out, and you know that cylinder one always needs a little bit more gasoline than cylinder two, you can de develop a table, for instance, that tells you how to make those adjustments. And you can then check with your cylinder pressure measurements, make sure you have them all going off at the same time with the same CA50. So in other words, there's calibration that goes on in the background. Where the work is needed, you know, in terms of model development, I think looking at fuels, looking at fuel effects, uh, the combustion of uh, alternative fuels, butanols, other alcohols, uh, real uh, emissions like the soot emissions, looking at uh, uh, the effect of the, the aromatics and so on. Uh, there's a lot of work still needed. And I, at the end of my next segment, I'm going to have kind of a future work thing. So maybe I'll come back to that then. OK. Yeah. Sure. So the question is, how do we know we're at an optimum? Uh, okay, so let's say we ran those thousand cases uh, for the GA optimization of natural gas diesel at one operating point. The first thing we say is we're going to reject any cases that have emissions outside of the EPA heavy duty specified emissions. So that throws away probably 950 cases. <laughs> And now you're left with 50 cases. OK, which are the ones that now have the best fuel efficiency? All right. And then basically you can pair away at the remaining 50, looking at them uh, to see which of them make sense. Uh, which, for example, you might have predicted some of them have uh, ignition dwells that are too short to have in a, a, a real injection system. So you can eliminate those and so on. So it's just a, it's an eyeballing exercise. Okay. So the engine test is way more difficult because uh, you know uh, it takes a long time to stabilize engine operation at a steady state operating point, and during that time you have to make slight adjustments as the whole system is heating up. The wall temperatures are coming up to equilibrium reduce the EGR rate slightly or increase it slightly. It's, it's a much more complex optimization uh, task to do it on the actual engine. That's another justification for multidimensional modeling. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so let me move to the last part of our uh, course here. And I want to show you just uh, two things. Uh, and the first part is work that we've been doing in, in a uh, vehicle application. But before I get to that, I wanted to uh, remind you that we've seen both light duty and heavy duty diesel engine uh, results. And I think you may have caught during the discussion that light duty engines are generally less efficient than heavy duty engines. And it's of interest to figure out why. Uh, so I can save a lot of time and tell you the answer right away. It's because the surface to volume ratio in the light duty engine is higher. And therefore, the heat losses are higher. But what is the impact of that? And I just wanted to talk about the use of CFD modeling to try to understand that a bit better. So we're fortunate we have these two engines that differ by a factor of uh, about five in um, uh, displacement, the Caterpillar Heavy Duty and the GM 1.9 liter engine. Um, operate them uh, at similar operating points. And you notice we're running at different speed. 
So if you take a look at the at engine scaling arguments and you look at say Nusselt numbers and so on, uh, as you change the characteristic dimension of the engine to keep the same Nusselt number, you have to change velocities. And this implies that for the light duty engine, you would have to you actually have to operate at pretty high speed, about 3,800 RPM, to have the same heat loss as you would in a lower speed engine. And this was just not practical for us in our lab. So we decided to operate at a, a speed that was close to what we were comfortable with, around 2,000 something RPM, uh, and take that into consideration. The main thing is that the kinetics, though, is really independent of speed, right? If you think about chemical kinetics, it only depends on temperature. So engine speed should only enter as a secondary consideration in, that, in its effect on temperatures. So that's one difference that you'll see there in when we compare these engines. But other than that, we're gonna be operating slightly different injection pressures in the small engine, make sure we don't impinge fuel against the liner or the piston. Um, to fuels, gasoline, diesel. One of the things that you'll notice just through the design of the, the original equipment manufacturer uh, engine itself uh, is the swirl ratio. I don't know if that's listed here. Uh, but the small engine has higher swirl than the large ed engine, and that's going to be something to consider. Okay, so here are some results <coughs> obtained with the <coughs> both experiments and modeling. <coughs> But I'm just showing you here the modeling results, or the, um, we'll show experiments in a minute. Um, so here's cylinder pressure versus crank angle for these two engines, the heavy duty engine, the light duty engine. And again, I'm showing you here as a function of combustion timing, CA50, uh, all operating at a similar operating point here. Uh, let's see, was it the nine bar? Yeah, nine bar operating point. Um, NOx, soot, gross efficiency, and this is a measure of pressure rise rate. Uh, you can see that all of, both the light duty in blue and the heavy duty in red are able to meet the EPA NOx emissions, uh, legislated emissions, for, at least for the heavy duty engine, uh, which we also use as, for guidance for the light duty engine. We're also able to meet soot emissions and gross efficiencies, and here, as I mentioned, the heavy duty engine has gross efficiencies that are five or seven percent higher than for the light. Uh, here we go, that's not true. Four, four percent, four to five percent higher for the light duty, for the heavy duty than the light duty. Importantly is this though, the efficiencies that uh, we're seeing with RCCI, when you compare them with standard diesel combustion, are five to seven percent higher um, for the heavy duty engine, you see efficiencies on the order of 48% for light, light duty engines around 45%. And we're getting in the range here of 50 to 55. So uh, why are we seeing this difference? What is causing the difference in efficiencies? So if you take a look at the energy budget, and here I'm showing uh, on the right hand side plot, the percent of the fuel energy that went to gross work or work output, indicated work, for the heavy duty and the light duty engine, you see that difference, is that, that difference we were just discussing. Uh, the exhaust energy is comparable, right? So temperatures in the exhaust are a little bit higher in the light duty engine. Heat transfer losses are higher. Uh, that has the, that's that surface to volume thing I was talking about. And also the combustion losses are higher. You add these two losses, and that explains this decrease over here. So basically, if you break down the fuel energy, you see the combustion losses are uh, about 2%. Uh, the combustion efficiency is 2% lower in the light duty engine. Heat transfer losses are about 3% additional uh, in the light duty engine. So what can we do about that? So here I'm showing you the heavy duty and the light duty uh, engine combustion traces and heat release traces uh, compared with the experiments just to make sure that we're at least uh, getting a good handle on the combustion process. 
And then we look at the uh, engine out. In this case, we're looking 40 degrees after top dead center at the location of the hydrocarbons and CO. Uh, and these uh, contours or surfaces here are demarcations uh, for the blue. It's for CO, CO greater than, what does that say, 2,000 ppm. And for the unburned hydrocarbon that's behind there is also 2,000 ppm. It's all coming from the crevice region, right? Uh, at least at this level of uh, uh, unburned hydrocarbon. So we've spent a lot of time recently working on strategies to redesign the ring pack, and I think I've mentioned that already. So emissions are uh, one concern. But the other is that efficiency loss. So <clears throat> looking at the differences, the light duty engine has a swirl ratio that's about two, the stock engine. That means compared to the crankshaft rotation, the fluid in the combustion chamber is rotating twice for every uh, crankshaft rotation. Uh, the heavy duty engine only has 0.7. So that implies you have additional convection heat transfer in the small engine. Also, the small engine has a higher surface to volume ratio, almost twice the surface to volume ratio. And also, and this wasn't really a big effect, but it has a lower uh, mean piston speed. So <clears throat> what if you were to try to take a small engine and make it operate uh, like the large engine? OK, so the lot I'm showing you on this plot here. This is gross indicated efficiency versus CA50 timing, the combustion timing. Um, what I'm showing in purple here is the results uh, that I showed you yesterday for the light duty engine. And the selected uh, timing, uh, CA50 timing for this operating point, uh, this is the mode five operating point, which is the nine bar uh, BMEP point, um, had a CA50 of around nine degrees after top dead center. So <clears throat> we had the, for this case, an aluminum piston in the engine uh, swirl ratio was actually uh, a little lower, it's 1.5, and with a boost pressure of 1.6 bar. If we were to install a turbocharger that allowed a slight increase in boost pressure, 2.2 bar higher, uh, keeping everything else the same, we could transition to this purple curve here. Uh, so you see that CA50 advances. Right, because higher pressures, faster kinetics, uh, and this is the curve that we get. Now, each point on this curve here corresponds to a different CA50 and a corresponding pressure rise rate. So we're also looking at maintaining reasonable pressure rise rates. This one was selected because the pressure rise rate was 8.6 bar per degree. If we'd gone all the way over here, we would have had much faster, higher pressure rise rate, which would be outside the limits of acceptability. Um, however, here you see that we can maintain the low pressure rise rates uh, with more advanced timing. Okay, so that's what happens if you simply increase the boost pressure. Looking at the effect of the swirl uh, ratio, we can slightly change the uh, performance. We go to the red curve here. Okay, so that's this one here. Uh, if we now look at heat transfer directly. Instead of using an aluminum piston, if we go to a steel piston, aluminum has a much higher thermal conductivity than steel. By going to a steel piston, you maintain higher surface temperatures in the combustion chamber. Remember, we simulated that also in the lab by turning off the under piston cooling jets. So basically, you reduce the heat losses by operating with a higher piston temperature. We can go from the, the red curve to the green curve. And then finally, if we lower the swirl ratio from the stock 2.2 swirl ratio or 1.5 as we were doing here to half that value, which is similar to the swirl ratio in the heavy duty engine, we can get to the blue curve here. So if we pick a, a pressure rise rate of around 10 bar per degree and compare it with what we had uh, in the analysis I showed you last time, there's a 10%, there's a potential for a 10% improvement in gross indicated efficiency. So if you think of what I showed you last time, we saw that with this point over here, we were getting 8% better 
compared to conventional diesel combustion. And if we add this extra 10%, which we think is possible by making these changes, we can get close to the Department of Energy's goals of a 20 uh, to 40 percent improvement in fuel efficiency for light duty uh, engines. So there's a lot of interesting research that could go to complement or validate some of these uh, predictions from the code. In particular, uh, we're also interested in looking at thermal barrier coatings on the piston and engine surfaces to try to reduce uh, heat loss and uh, maintain higher uh, surface temperatures. So, yeah. For, that's correct. Adiabatic combustion for standard diesel combustion. Right. So what they found was that the exhaust gas temperature increased, and you got very little uh, work, inc uh, work benefit from the increased, the reduced heat loss. It all went into heating up the exhaust. And in those days, that was essentially a, a big problem because they were not worried so much about uh, the, uh, the turbocharger system. Nowadays, having higher exhaust temperature is actually really helpful because you can use that energy to drive your turbocharger system to improve the boost uh, pressure and thereby gain efficiencies. So it's a different issue these days than it was back then. This is right. So, so here I'm saying that we would like to have an improvement in the boost pressure of about 0.2 bar, and that's what got us from the red to sorry the purple to the blue here. So turbocharger efficiency is key to improving the performance here. And you can do that with, as I say, uh, if you have higher exhaust temperatures. However, there's another big difference. This is low temperature combustion, right? We have no nitric oxide coming out of the engine here. With conventional diesel, you've got 10 gram per kilowatt hour or 20 gram per kilowatt hour. Uh, that requires a huge amount of either retardation of combustion to get rid of that NOx or SCR fluid. So it's, it's a different, uh, different strategy. If, uh, um, I really recommend that you guys read, read Sage Kogjan's thesis. He goes into that in great detail in his thesis. And basically what you find is for some reason that some thermodynamicist is going to have to explain to me one day, you get about half of the energy back as improvement in work, and the other half goes to increasing the exhaust temperatures. So if you made an engine that was completely thermodynamically isolated, adiabatic engine, your exhaust temperatures will uh, go up using half of the additional energy, the other half goes to work, roughly speaking. I don't understand why that is and no thermodynamicist has explained it to me yet, but there must be a reason for it. Absolutely, so that it's gonna benefit the catalyst as well, yeah. Okay, let's take a break till uh, 11.15, and then I will talk about the next topic, which is putting all of this into a car.